well, you talk me through what, what you saw in it and, okay. and how okay. you interpret what's there. Um, this, this was very, um, you could say that, uh, yeah, definitely, there, there, was, there was not very subtle currents of racism in this piece, so it's kind of a good example of a mix between some that's fairly uh, somewhat unusual and some, but also there's a lot of mundanity to it as well. Um, one of the key things that came out, in, I suppose, in, in the 90s and in, in, in the turn, at the turn of the century in, um, in the UK in terms of racism was, was understanding uh, the perspectives of white students um, and how that you, you need to do that in order, you know, if you're focusing on the minority constantly, you're actually con somehow contributing to the othering processes. Mm -hmm. So um, this is another kind of, if you like, uh, branch of, of, of analysis that I was deliberately, I mean, there were, in the vast majority, I was deliberately looking at the experiences of, um, and, and the heterogeneity amongst white Irish students, um, and, uh, the, you know, how they position themselves relevant, rel relative to immigrant students. So, uh, I've got two girls here, Rachel and Tara, who are from, uh, I guess, working class areas that wouldn't be seen as, as desirable as where the school itself is located. I mean, um, just from um, a, a little snippet of the data itself, um, I asked, I was asking the girls, how come you don't go to your local primary school? Or, sorry, your local post-primary school, because they went to the primary school that was closest to them. Um, and they said, I said, do you not have close to, sco do you not have close to schools to you? Um, and Rachel said, yeah, but I wasn't allowed to go to the school around the corner from me. And I said, why? And she says, because my brothers and sisters went there and my brother left three weeks before his mocks, which is a trial state examination. Um, my sister got kicked out for not having her exam papers and she never went back. So I wasn't allowed to go to the school. And I said, your parents didn't think. And she said, yeah. So I just had, it was either here or St. Declan's. And the two girls um, have very kind of working class accents. And, you know, um, I suppose we come across regularly, came across regularly in um, their class setting as somehow quite resistant to, to school. And, and um, uh, what, what, I, what I was suggesting with them and with, with students um, who s somehow fit or that category was that they were experiencing a form of ine class inequality and also gender inequality um, in, in different ways already before uh, race became a, a local or overtly local issue um, in, ter in, the, in this context. So um, how do they reposition themselves, um, I suppose, and how, what strategies do they, do they develop to justify their, their own identities and how do they relate, what discourses do they deploy or do they draw on to, to do that? Um, and how can we understand them, um, possibly, and, and what strategies they use? So, um, as the as the interview went on, um, I talked to them, and they they met. We we talked about different students. We talked about immigrant students and Irish students, etc. And uh, they mentioned um, Adiola and Omolara, who are two good friends who are from Nigeria, two girls. Um, and they mentioned a, a number of Asian boys from different Asian countries, from India, China, uh, and from the Philippines. And. Uh, all of these kids are in the same class, which is a lower level class. Uh, there's two tiers, A band and B band, and they're in the they're in the lower level uh, with these kids. Um, and it's 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 it was interesting to me how they both use resi and resist um, discourses of talking about uh, working in school and hard work, and how they position themselves contradictorily both as um, for work, but against school, if you like, in, in some ways, which is, was quite common, in, I, I, I think, in, in the literature on resistance, um, and that it tends to be quite a contradictory thing for some students. Um, and uh, how, the, how um, they might deploy both liberal and uh, liberal anti-racism and racism at the same time um, in their talk about others, if you like. So Rachel is talking about um, two, the two Nigerian girls in her class. Um, Rachel says, I don't know, like Adiola and Omolara in our class, like at the start of second year, Omolara used to be always talking, you know, with them, I guess. And like after the summer, it's like, yeah, get away from me and all that sort of thing. Like she was a bit real bitchy and like it would offend Adiola because she was the same color as her and all. Um, now from that statement, uh, going back to the context of the two girls, they're both in, sco in a school setting um, that's, I guess, um, in crude terms, a cut above their neighbourhood. And what I was suggesting from a class point of view is that they're already experiencing a, a kind of a, um, 
a, a, a kind of a, a split in their subjectivity in terms of you know having to negotiate the neighborhood that they're from, but also and but also being upwardly mobile in this school, if you like. Um, and then what you have is upwardly mobile black girls in in the school with them. Um, and it, to, to me, what that was suggesting from a, from a, I guess from a, a psychodynamic point of view, um, that in some way puts a mirror back on their own negotiation of subjectivity and their own kind of um, the contradictions that they have to um, manage as girls and as, as working class girls. Um, and, uh, you know, just how they position themselves relative to two really good black girls who are called Adiola and Omelara, and then they refer to um, a bad black girl who they find is, who, who Tara finds very entertaining. She says, I had a fight with Faye yesterday, and sh we always have fights. She's gas, you know, gas meaning hilarious. Um, I said, and, and I ask, coming from that, do you, do you think people have, I wouldn't say a problem, but an issue with people of different color in the school? And um, you see, the amount of contradictions that are here are amazing in, in, the, in, this, in the space of a breath. Um, Rachel says sometimes, and Tara says, I don't. My nephew is half caste. And she says, my sister's, and she waits for me um, to say something. And I said, your sister's boyfriend's black, is he? So, and she says, yeah. And I said, where is he from? And she says, he's from England. He's not black, black. He's kind of, but you'd know. He has brown skin, yeah. So there's, there's lots of things being cited here in terms of, well, you know, you know someone is black, uh, and there's a purity about that. And, you know, um, very kind of um, centuries-old discourses about purity of different races and, and essential differences between them, um, and how those are deployed in different ways. Um, and uh, but he's okay, and we're okay with it, and you know those kind of liberal um, kind of ideas being coming into the mix. Um, now, what's what's kind of interesting is that um, you know, our, in other parts of the interview, the girls don't see themselves as kind of um, incompatible with hard work. But at the same time, um, they do have to position themselves uh, in some ways against what the school is doing, um, you know. And they look at students who are doing immigrant students who are doing very well, um, or are perceived to be doing very well. In actual terms, they're not. They're, they're actually in the same class, and they're you know it's just they're seen as swats, as, as the girls call them. Um, and so later in the interview, they're referring to some of the, some of the boys in the class. They're not swats. They just don't like making a joke. Uh, like Bar Baran, he's well. He's nice. I think he's nice. He's just very quiet. And Rachel says Billy's quieter. Um, Billy is Chinese. Oh, he's very quiet. He kind of freaks me out a bit. Um, Rachel says, "Yeah." And Tara says, "Yeah." But he can remember like the whole lot. He used to write down an essay thing. We had to remember it off, and he remembered the whole lot as if he's got some sort of um, powers that you know. Mm. Um, are they the only two swats in the class um, using their language? Obviously, you know. Um, no, Robert. Robert and Adiola, they're all right though. So like, you know, it's it's in, the girls are not saying for a moment that being a SWAT is something that's um, uh, there's something wrong with it as such. But at the same time, it is another uh, to them. Uh, you know, there's there's a kind of a a, a couple of things going on there. Uh, and Rachel says they're smart but nice. You know, um, and it's interesting then how the girl look in a further excerpt of the of the interview the girls do is is refer to a time, a more romantic time, if you like, and constitute their own identities through that, where they talk about their first year classes before they were all split up into different um, class groups. Um, and uh, what, what becomes quite clear in terms of institutional processes is that, um, and it became clear throughout the, the it, it's clear in the Irish setting anyway, and in terms of the literature on, on tracking, or on, on, on lots of on types of hi hierarchical modes of organizing organizing learnings in school learning in schools is that it tends to be more for administrative and disciplinary purposes that kids are put into certain groups than pedagogical and cognitive <laughs> purposes if you like mm -hmm. so um, it's quite interesting that the girls are very aware of the fact that they have been disciplined and that they are not good and that their year actually and the group the year group that they're in are supposed to be notorious which I heard uh, quite regularly. Um, you know, if you if you skip down to the end of that that piece, um, I asked them. Tara says just near, just um, in the in the bottom third of the of the page, because we're like the worst year in the school. You know, that's why we got split up. Um, well, it's supposed to be. That's your year. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because they always tell us that that we're either one of the either the worst class or else we're the worst year they've ever had. Who's told you that? 
I say most of the teachers when we were in assembly they, t they, they were always saying that's why they split us up you know so um, they refer to kind of the, the, the really sound girls in, in, the, in the school the girls who, um, who they used to be in class with who they could mess with and kind of have fun with and you know there's a lot there in terms of um, uh, how class resistance to school and how kids who find themselves in the brunt of um, being told that they're not good enough implicitly or explicitly that um, they uh, adopt tactics like um, uh, that look like they're you know um, just not working or they're not learning something and one of the one of the things that came out for me uh, about this was that the girls are constantly trying to but they uh, I suppose um, I'm putting a language on it that maybe they don't have um, uh, in this particular instance or at this moment where uh, what I'm saying is that they have learned a huge amount in their three years in the school and they've learned a huge amount about how to negotiate the context and they've learned a huge amount about how to um, reposition themselves as things changed because the, it used to be a three band um, tiered school and now it's two bands and that's supposed to be more equal but you know it's just become more complex for them they, they, have, mm -hmm. they, they, they talk about how they um, resist the school or, or uh, row in with the school in, in more complex ways um, so you know the, for me there's a massive amount in a small in a short in a short excerpt of data um, that's that's not supposed to be read as an authoritative you know this is exactly what's happening here but it's more a kind of um, uh, an extraction of well what seems to be guiding meaning here what seems to be meaningful and what seems to be um, uh, you know, reasonable or sort of resonating um, in terms of in terms of what's coming out of the context. You've mm. given quite a, a detailed and kind yeah. of in-depth kind of analysis of what's happening here. Presumably, that didn't all come at once. Did you have to work hard Very at that? Hard, or, yeah. I mean, how did you recognise even that this particular passage had this yeah. potential in it? I guess um, a, lot, a number of the passages that I use are actually quite by accident because um, in doing in the study that I did, um, I was very much focused on initially on the singularity of racism and, and the identities um, as constituted through either social class or through gender or through um, race and ethnicity. But what, what I found happening was that um, I needed to be very open-minded and kind of come at something from a class point of view and see how that might lead to talking about race, for example. So um, what I'm saying is, is that I constantly just read reams and reams of transcripts. And uh, I, would, I would come at something largely experimentally, I'd have to say. And I would come at it from the point of view of different identities. Like, mm -hmm. identity, like you can see, um, and this is coming from Deborah's work um, as well, that I've, I've actually written out chains of identity categories, yes. uh, like 15-year-old, white, Irish, working class, female, student. And what, what, um, the reason that that's there is I'm putting that front and centre to say that these categories are actually, um, what Deborah says is that they, um, she says that stu student subjectivities and educational exclusions are tied together by the networks of discourse that make constellations of identity categories meaningful. Um, so from a, from a pragmatic point of view, um, what I would do is constantly read and reread transcripts from the point of view of different, the workings of different identity categories mm -hmm. and uh, look for the potential there. And often I'd, I'd have to be extremely open-minded about how I did that um, and extremely, um, you know, and, and just have patience with it. Yeah, you know, it sounds I, like you had certain questions in mind that you were looking did, at the yeah, text and yeah. saying, how do they do this? How yeah. do they Performing construct it. this yeah. identity? How do they maintain it? How yeah. do they yeah. um, oppose another identity and so on? Those exactly. kind of, was that, that's yes. that right? Yeah. Yes, I'm yeah. Getting, yeah. And it was never, the questions yeah. changed depending on, on what, mm -hmm. what I saw. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid I, I don't come across as very uh, linear in, in how I do things. It tends to be a lot more experimental. Mm -hmm. But I do have mm -hmm. very clear um, critical questions. And it, it is very much about how in, it became to be very much about how inequalities intersect and not kind of um, mm -hmm. coming at it with this mm -hmm. uh, with, with in terms of ra understanding racism not coming at it in terms of you know a very simplistic analysis like oh you know the, the working class kids tend to be a lot more overtly racist and that's just because working ki class kids are, tend to be more like that it was, it was very much about well what are the inequalities that they've, they're experiencing 
that um, and uh, that's homogenizing as a group anyway. But um, or what what is the particular experience, the context, and the history of the of people's identities that leads them to either be overtly racist or say so, or why is it meaningful for someone to say something overtly racist and mm. get away with mm. it or not and mm. get in trouble for it and how come other kids manage to be complicit with it but and somehow still manage to manage this identity as a good learner mm. as a good kid and something that was really great about Deborah's work is that you know she she talks about how um, this idea that you know how can we understand how students are made desirable or undesirable or viable or unviable um, as learners or as classmates because that's really where the question is at um, I think now rather than thinking well how do we include um, gay kids you know because mm. it's 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 already making an assumption about gay kids mm. you know and uh, that they're that they are of this particular nature um, you know, so that's that's really where where it, that's. Is this related to this idea of intersectionality Absolutely, that you yeah. talked about? Yes, yeah. that the, yeah. the, the the differences are intermingled mm. in ways that cannot be disentangled. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah.